cast. You don't go to see a movie just to hear the soundtrack, uh, just as you don't go to see a movie to see something blow up. Um, it's all about story, and that's why story is pivotal. So with sound, what is our role? What are we trying to convey? The story is important, but we're also trying to convey emotion. We're trying to convey, orchestrate ambiences, movement, immersion, the unexpected. Um, you know, if we look back at classic movies like Jaws, uh, you know, technology failed. That shark did not do what it was supposed to do, and Spielberg was forced to take uh, an alternative route, which probably helped make the film as successful as it was which is that our minds always do a better job sometimes of portraying certain things than being given the visual representation. But the camera movement alone to convey the presence of the shark was not good enough, but it really relied upon that amazing score that John Williams brought to it that really helped set the emotion and the fear that, oh my God, is this thing gonna pop out and like, you know, chomp somebody's head off, so. Um, so that's kind of like the, you know, an overview of sound, uh, which I'm going to go more into detail in a minute, but you know, we're also talking about image. W what is happening in digital cinema right now? We have an array of technologies that are out there in the marketplace. Um, so currently the predominant standard is 2K. 4K is now starting to gain traction within the industry. Um, Sony was the first uh, company to bring it out, and now TI and, and digital cinema projection technologies are also uh, coming on board now with Series 2 projectors. 3D, again, another tool that can help you as a filmmaker. 3D is not going to save your story. Again, story is important, but how could 3D help you in your story? How can it take you to an immersive world like Cameron did um, in Avatar? But the most important thing about image and all of these things in digital cinema is it finally empowers you as a filmmaker. For years, you have struggled with the fact of having to deal with film, and it was such a cost-prohibitive medium that now, as digital cinema progresses, it really opens up the avenues, plus the ability of technology that's given out now uh, across all platforms and industries as prosumers, as consumers, that really opens up the field for other things to happen. And, uh, you know, an, an example of that would be, I talk at a lot of film festivals, and several years ago I, I sat on a film festival uh, with a panel of filmmakers, and I talked about how the evolution of cinema with digital would mean at some point exhibition could also be a studio slash distributor. Uh, and no one believed me at that time, but now here we are in 2011, and AMC Theatres and Regal Entertainment have made a joint venture which is called Open Road Films. They've now invested in film production and have created their own production and their own distribution avenue. So now there's another alternative route to bring content to moviegoers uh, in, in North America. Uh, I put down there at the bottom about high frame rate um, because high frame rate is on the horizon. Uh, again, it's another technology, it's a stylization. Uh, the first company that's probably gonna bring it to fruition is uh, Peter Jackson with The Hobbit which is scheduled for December release of next year. You know, and Peter chose the Red Epic camera and he's shooting that movie at 48 frames per second. And that's really because with 3D, we have some inherent issues with regards to the technology dealing with fast motion. Fast motion and movement doesn't portray very well in 3D playback. Uh, and high frame rate can help overcome that stylization and present a much smoother image and present uh, also a greater uh, sense of depth and also smoother image on the eyes when viewing in 3D. James Cameron is also looking heavily at high frame rate, as you've probably already seen in all the media and blogs. And James is looking at either 48 or 60 frames. Uh, we as a company are heavily invested in this and in as we develop our next generation media blocks that we want to give you the option of either 48 or 60 and not constrain you as a filmmaker. So what does sound in 3D mean? What does it equate to? So the original goal was it was to create an immersive experience. Our brains do something very interesting when image and sounds collide. If you listen to sound by itself, it takes on its own shape and feel. But when you couple that with an image, it takes on a whole different ideology. Uh, and the way we process the location and proximity of sounds versus the images that we're looking at now begins to change. 
So I kind of want to explain where we are with sound historically and as we go through as to some of the new technologies that we brought to market. If we look at 5.1, it's been the standard in the world since the uh, early 90s and we launched it with Dolby Digital on film with Batman Returns. And at that time, we were able to squeeze six channels of audio onto a tiny data block which sits between the sprockets of 35 millimeter film. But more importantly, we could get our logo in there as well. It's all about branding, it's all about marketing. Uh, oh, my theater layout doesn't look too good. Uh, is there anything we can do about that? Nope. Um, well, anyway, this is a, a 5.1 theater. There are supposed to be seats there in the middle, which are not showing up very well. Uh, and this is kind of the standard surround configuration we've been used to in theaters. So now you can see with the red and the yellow, we kind of like have these two L configurations for left surround and right surround. So what we can do with sound now is we're able to move objects into the room. Over here on the left now, you can see I brought an airplane in. But now the airplane is to the side of the audience and also behind them at the same time due to the inherent configuration of the auditorium. So it does actually present some artistic challenges in how you want to portray your sound versus the image that you're looking at. Also with 5.1, I can now move that sound and send it across the auditorium, but the other problem as well is that being in the auditorium to the side, it also can be kind of difficult to understand that sensation of movement because we're predominantly hearing from the left and also the back um, as the sound moves over to the side. So another byproduct of what we can do with 5.1 is we can also, a unique feature is I can send the sound to the middle of the auditorium. Um, how many of you, when you go and watch a movie, sit in the middle of the theater? Okay, so this is, as you're all aware, is, is the magic spot because what happens, if we uh, illuminate both sides of the room at the same time, we create this weird null and in the middle of the room, that sound will now lift and actually give you the sensation of sound being over you as opposed to being at the side of you. So that's pretty much why everyone always kind of migrates to the middle of the room. Uh, another tool for 5.1 is that having stereo surrounds, we could also send independent objects from front to back. But again, we're limited because we only have two zones of, uh, of sound. So with technology, much like film, we always have a story. Technology doesn't happen for chance. It always happens for a reason. Um, and the technology that I'm going to talk to you about right now is Dolby Surround 7.1 and how that came about. So in 2008, uh, we worked with a filmmaker, John Lasseter. And John Lasseter was working on Toy Story 3. Toy Story 3 was going to be the end of the trilogy, but also for the first time be presented in 3D and presented this new medium. So John tasked Paul Sihockey, the post-production supervisor, and Gary Rydstrom, an Academy Award-winning sound designer and director at Pixar. He wanted them to go out and see what was available in the industry. He felt now that image had moved for the first time beyond sound and that now sound was holding back the complete picture of the immersive experience that 5.1 kind of felt that sound was doing this as opposed to immersing the audience, and what was available as a technology that could improve upon this. So working with Pixar Animation uh, in 2009, we went through a series of tests, which was to see what we could do. With digital cinema now, we had far more bandwidth to be able to deliver audio. Everything now is bit for bit accurate as to what is happening on the dub stage because we have that technology and we have that bandwidth. Um, so working with Lee Unkridge uh, and Paul Sayaki, we also work with our partners at Skywalker, and Tom Myers and Michael Semanek were the mixers um, on Toy Story 3, who also helped with a test that we did to verify what we could do. So what is Dolby Surround 7.1? We now have four surround zones in the theater as opposed to two. So what can we do differently? Well, if you recall Toy Story 2, we went back and remixed some sequences from Pixar to help convey what could happen. In Toy Story 2, Ham was on the screen and there was a sequence where the toys are trying to cross the road. And in that sequence, the camera was pointed on the characters and Ham was saying to Buzz uh, and Woody, why did the toys cross the road? 
And they re responded, I don't know, why did the toys cross the road? And then the camera does a complete 180 shot and is now looking at Al's toy barn. So in theory, Ham is now behind the audience. But in 5.1, we couldn't portray that sense of change of shift of, of pers perspective. And Ham had to remain on the screen. So one of the things that we could easily convey was in the 7.1 remix of this, as soon as the camera panned, we now had Ham appear behind the audience, which now really helped reinforce what was happening. It wasn't a distraction. You were given a completely different perspective, and now you were being reinforced in the reality of what was going on with Ham. So part of the other benefits of having four surround zones now means that we can better accurately portray visually what is happening at the, on the screen at the same time. So using this helicopter, as it flies down the side of the auditorium, we only activate the side wall. As it goes out the back of the theater, we then activate the back wall. So now we can create that disconnect and full sensation of movement to the audience. I can now also make the helicopter fly around the room, and as it moves across the back wall, we can also reinforce that change of perspective. So now we can really add, in essence, a three dimension that we can have things happening off camera that we can't portray, but we can reinforce using sound to help make this happen. So now in my instance then, uh, you know, if we take Walter Murch and the amazing work that he did with Apocalypse Now, we could have that helicopter come off the screen, go around the room, auditory, and then reappear back on the screen to reinforce that sensation of movement. And now the helicopter can go off to the side, and then again, we lose the back wall, but now have the direct positioning of presenting sides to the, uh, presenting the image to the size, side of the audience. So we can do a lot of really interesting things. Um, Gary Rizzo, uh, there's a lot of Garys in the industry, so Gary Rizzo, he was the Academy Award winning mixer on Tron Legacy. And in that particular feature, Gary used all four surround zones in the sequence where Flynn comes up into the arena and now using different delays and different reverbs in each of those four zones. You no longer felt you were in this tiny room watching a movie on a screen. You felt you were in, much like the character, the sensation of being immersed and being in a giant arena and hearing all of the chants around you and now basically being able to expand the capabilities of sound design that can really help with your storytelling and help reinforce what is happening. So Dolby Surround 7.1 came out last year. We officially launched it with um, Pixar and Toy Story 3. And it's only available for digital cinema. Unfortunately, film was limited in what we could do. So this is really only available uh, as like a DCP, a, a digital cinema package. So in just over a year, we've actually had 30 feature films released worldwide. Uh, and we've had great support from the industry, not only in exhibition, as in putting in 7.1 has been the lowest cost of ownership. Um, 7.1 for an exhibited upgrade from 5.1 was a uh, infrastructure cost of under $1,000. And now they're able to attain a unique differentiator and also help you as a filmmaker. Uh, from the studio side, we're supported by eight major film studios. And it's not just Hollywood as well. Um, here in the example of some of the releases that have happened, but we've got like three major releases there from Hollywood. But Bollywood in India, as they've progressed into the digital medium, they've also embraced this. Um, from a music point of view, going from 5.1 to 7.1 really helps the reproduction of music. Having that inherent configuration of an L, you can get with so many speakers being put together, you can get comb filtering, some distortion may happen because we're feeding the same signal across so many. Breaking the sound up into four zones really helps the resolution and imaging um, of what you're trying to purvey. So for content beyond cinema, what can we do? Um, cinema is always at the forefront and at the beginning of technology uh, for the entertainment experience and Dolby's been in this space for over 40 years. Uh, and our role really is to not only provide you tools, but we want to preserve your intent. What it, we had found had happened within the consumer market, because consumer for a period of time shot ahead of, of, uh, of, of cinema, was that Blu-ray gave the capability of 7.1, which now meant you mixed your film, it was released theatrically in 5.1, 
but now you were potentially going to go back and remix it to make it 7-1. So it was a cost burden, but also now you're going back and changing it, which you may not have wanted to do, but you're trying to do this to fulfill uh, the requests of the market. Now having 7-1, we can now pass that through the stream. So now it can go from cinema to the home and beyond. Um, I don't know if you're going to be here tomorrow or capture it online, but uh, my colleague Brett Crockett will be here tomorrow to explain how we can transition the cinema experience of 7.1 beyond into broadcast and mobile and PC and, and, and the work that we're doing downstream. So for now, I want to thank you all for your time and, and again, for, for all the work that you do. Um, you know, Dolby's here to support you. Uh, you know, as young filmmakers, we have screening rooms here uh, in the US. Uh, and also in the UK, and um, you know, where we can, we certainly want to help you. We provide production services that can help you with alignments, digital cinema. It's a whole new paradigm uh, for small distribution releases. We can help you with that. We have mastering services where we can help transfer your content and create a DCP for you. And can also help you with regards to managing keys and so on. Again, for kind of like film festivals and small releases. Uh, but that's it from me. Thank you for your time.